Thanks a lot, Frida. I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point, I just want to uh, appreciate all of you for logging in. And I want to officially announce to us that we are on Facebook Live. Amen. So this is a, a really great Amen. thing for us. Um, myself, I'm able to go to Facebook because I have my phone and I'm using my laptop. So um, I am liking the, the meeting on Facebook. So the next thing I want to do is to, uh, to bring to us a very special guest joining us from the USA. Pastor Isaac Curry is an author. He's a pastor. He's a relationships coach. He is a hope pusher. He is a change catalyst, and he's a bridge builder. Pastor Isaac Curry uh, is a pastor of the Singles Ministry in uh, Hope Church in the, in the U.S., and he has been on our forums. He's been our conference speaker at Parklands Baptist. He's spoken to us at our singles event, and he is a man of God who is so passionate about adults, uh, adult singles, living for God in this generation. So I want you to join me as I bring to us the servant of God, our, our, a man of God that we really, really love and admire, Pastor Isaac Curry. Welcome, Pastor. Hey, how you doing? We are fine, thank you. Hi. Hi. You... Hey, everybody. Y'all unmute yourself. Hi. I want to say hey to Hi. you. Hi. 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 Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. We've missed you too. What's going on? How y'all doing? James, Melvin, how y'all doing? It's good to see, see you. Great. Good to see you too, yeah. Pastor Kaisak. I'm so, I'm, I hate that I can't be there uh, physically, but I'm glad and I'm grateful to God for um, technology. Amen, everybody? Amen. 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 Listen. Amen. 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 Everybody, Amen. everybody can hear me? No yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Hear you. I, yes. Praise the Lord. I asked uh, yeah. Pastor uh, to uh, record this session so that I can receive it. Hopefully, prayerfully, uh, we don't have any technical difficulties. Uh, but the things that I intend to talk to you about today, I wouldn't be surprised if we receive some type of spiritual war. So just make sure you're praying with me um, as we... Um, engage in um, some important dialogue. But first, I just want to say I'm so glad to be able to fellowship with you. I had been wondering when I would be able to um, join you again. Um, and so I'm so, so glad that Pastor invited me. Everybody, you can go ahead and mute your phone. I mean, mute your devices yes. or your phone. Yes. Um, but I'm so, I want to be abundantly clear. I'm in my, my room where I try to record videos, and I know that I have Maasai material, Maasai um, things on my wall. I didn't just put that there because I knew <laughs> I was going to be uh, speaking. I want you to know that this is the layout of my room, and I've had that since 2008. And so um, I'm not just you know, doing that. Kenya is my home, and it was gifted to me, and so I have a lot of things around my room. Um, that reminds me of home. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, it's just befitting that I'm speaking to family at home in Kenya. Um, I'm looking at all your faces and I am absolutely thrilled. We have, we have um, 75 people online. That's a lot of people to be, uh, to be engaged on a Sunday afternoon in Kenya and right now it's the 7 a.m. hour in Memphis. Now I'm just going to put this out there everybody. Go ahead and mute your devices. I'm just going to put this out there. Um, I hope this isn't my last time that pastor invites me. So uh, so pastor Felice, I'm, I'm, just yes. I'm just putting that out. I will always invite you. <laughs> All right. There is no excuse for us not to do this again and to do this yes. soon. Um, so I will be speaking with your pastor. So let's be prayerful because in this time of the pandemic, we're going to be as creative as possible to engage you with um, the word of God. And so we aren't going to allow this season uh, to pass us by and we remain unfruitful. 
So we will be partnering in the near future. So I hope you expect to see me again soon. If you don't, talk to Pastor Felista and then then um, she can't avoid inviting me back. Pastor, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I, don't, I don't ever take it for granted to be able to engage um, and partner with you, uh, the Singles Ministry, the Ark Ministry, and Parkman's Baptist Church in general. Uh, so again, thank you. Uh, if you have a chance, make sure you get to my Facebook page, I am Isaac Curry. You can get to my YouTube page at Isaac Curry. Subscribe there um, just to make sure we remain connected. Without further ado, I've been given time um, to minister what I believe God has on my heart to share with you this season. Um, and Pastor Felista has a heart to engage you and to bless you and to keep you informed and to draw you closer uh, to the Lord. And so I am tapping, I'm putting my hand on her pulse as I put my hand on the pulse collectively of the art ministry and all of you who are here. I just want you to know that um, it's a rough time in the entire country, in the entire world. Um, and so uh, this is a time that we will depend and trust on the Lord if ever we've done so before. Um, I don't hear you saying amen, but I trust you saying amen. Uh, you can always make remarks in the chat section as I'm sharing the word of God with you. Meet me at, Ezra, at the book of Ezra, chapter seven. Go ahead, if you can, mute your devices. Um, uh, Felista, you can manually mute everybody uh, from your device since you are um, actually the um, host. So devices that are not muted, you can actually mute it. Um, so I praise the Lord for the opportunity to be able to engage you. Um, we will be looking at two chapters today, uh, chapter seven and eight. And, and what I want you to know what today is specifically is not necessarily a relationships message. This is not a message speaking to symptoms, um, but we're going to deal with something that I believe God really would like for us to focus on in this season of isolation, in this season of um, uncertainty and anxiety. Um, what you're experiencing in Africa, what you're experiencing in Africa, we're experiencing around uh, the world. And so... Um, this is an opportunity for us to engage one another and to engage the word of God. Chapter seven of the book of Ezra. I wanna call your attention there and I wanna share with you from the subject, how to exit the wilderness. So I hope you have your something to write with, something to write on. And as you're having something to write with, something to write on, do me a favor. And again, if you can mute your devices, go ahead and mute your devices. Um, that would be very helpful. I'm talking to you from the subject, um, how to exit the wilderness. How to exit the wilderness. So let me pray with you. God, our Father, we thank you for um, this day we thank you, God, for technology, for the ability to be able to speak and minister to one another from across the world. And so, God, I thank you for my Kenyan family. Of course, I thank you for my U.S. family, but I thank you that we can um, dive into your word, although we can't see and, and engage each other in person, yet we can see one another uh, through this um, through these devices and through technology. So God, right now, although time zones are different, although we're in, in different places, your spirit makes us one. And so the same God on the other side of the world is the same God right here where I am. And so God, we thank you for being omnipresent everywhere at one time. And so God, we thank you that although we are uncertain about tomorrow, although there is anxiety, loneliness, uh, grief all around, we know that you have 
um, our lives in the very palm of your hand. You know our tomorrow because you're in our tomorrow. You're in our yesterday and you're in our today. So God, we trust you right now that you give, a, give us a rhema word from on high, that you speak to us where we need to be spoken to. So unplug our ears, make the, make the, the, the soil of our hearts fertile, Allow us to receive what you have for us on today. In the name of Jesus, we receive your word. And God, we remove every distraction at this moment because God, we know that you have something to say to us and we're ready to receive it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now, listen. Um, I want to talk to you from the subject how to exit the wilderness. One thing is absolutely certain. As believers, as Christians, one thing we can expect to occur in our lifetime is, is that we will have multiple experiences in which we find ourselves inside of the wilderness. And when I say wilderness, Wilderness experiences throughout the Bible are times in which the people of God are in an isolated and uh, uncertain in a place, in a time, in a season where they are being pruned, where they are being rebuked, where they're being trained. Uh, but these times of isolations never really feel good. Throughout the Bible, not just in the New Testament, not just in the Old Testament, but throughout the Bible, histor history teaches us that believers, whether you are David, whether you are Jesus the Christ, no matter who you are, we experience times in which we enter into a wilderness, and this time usually is a time that does not feel good, but on the other side of the wilderness is usually productivity, elevation, and, and increase. But many times we don't handle our wilderness experiences well. Many times we don't prepare for our wilderness experiences the way that we need to prepare for them. And many times we don't know how to exit the wilderness well. I love Jesus. We could have looked at Luke chapter 4 where he went to, where he was led. The Bible said the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. And the Holy Spirit kept him, and he also exited the wilderness. We could focus on that, but we're not going to deal with that today. Maybe we come back and we talk about it another time. But one thing I need you to understand, as a Christian, we will enter into seasons where we feel that we don't hear God, we don't see God, we don't sense God. It doesn't mean that God is not there, but there are times when we experience wilderness experiences physically and spiritually. We're not physically, literally, and spiritually. You look at Daniel. Daniel was taken up from Jerusalem and moved to Babylon, and he was in captivity his entire life. 70 years they were in captivity. This was a, a literal and a spiritual wilderness experience. Not just Jesus, but everybody who did something that, that mattered, who was transformative in the word of God, had almost everybody had these experiences in which they were asking God, what are you doing? I can't wait because I'm actually going into a series in the near future called What Is God Doing? But that's a whole nother conversation. I want to stay focused on the wilderness experience or how to exit the wilderness properly. So what I want to be able to do today is I want to talk to you a little bit about the wilderness experience. I want to talk to you about how to, what you need to do while you're in the wilderness and how you actually walk out of the wilderness well, because you don't want to mismanage the season that God is preparing you for. There is a season that you're about to walk into, but if you are hyper-focused on what you do not have, if you're hyper-focused on loneliness, if you're hyper-focused on anxiety, if you're hyper-focused on money that you do not have, bills that cannot be paid, all these things that do matter, but the enemy would, would much prefer that you remain focused on what you cannot control. 
And he will want you to focus on that and you try to manufacture something instead of giving it to God. So the enemy is strategic in what he will try to do while we're in the wilderness. Just think of it, for example, we're in, we're in Ezra, but just think about how strategic the enemy is because even when Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, the Bible says in Luke chapter four, verses one through four, that at the end of that, Jesus became hungry. He was hungry because he hadn't, eat, he hadn't eaten because he was fasting, I'm gonna get there, while he was in the wilderness. Jesus was fasting while he was in the wilderness and when he exited the wilderness, the Bible says that he was hungry and then the enemy comes and he, the first thing the enemy does is he tempts him to change his, he changed stone into bread, stone into food, because Jesus was hungry. So he was strategic in how he attempted to tempt Jesus Christ. So the enemy in this season is absolutely strategic in what he is waging war in your life specifically. Everybody in here, if there is 78 people online and there's some people on Facebook, whatever it is, trust me when I tell you that during this season, the enemy is absolutely strategic. And he will want you to get all focus on what you do not have and what you cannot control, when in fact, this season is no different than the last wilderness season you experienced. Because many times we forget what God did for us in our last season. And so if we forget, then we go back through the same process of trying to manufacture or control things on our own, when in fact, do the same thing you did last season if you exited your wilderness well. But sometimes when you don't leave your season well and you don't prepare yourself while you're in your season, what will happen is you'll continue to repeat that same exercise until you pass the test. The wilderness is not always to punish you as the enemy will want you to believe. The wilderness is not about abandonment. The wilderness many times reveals to you what's, what's on the inside of you. The wilderness is designed to prepare you for where you're going. God shows us ourselves when we are in the wilderness. It is the, the, the greatest, it is the greatest time and opportunity for God to actually reveal to us our own selves. And so when we're in the wilderness, let's just be honest, we're in a time like this. And if we are honest, many of us, because we've never seen this before, might be responding in ways that we didn't realize. We didn't realize our faith had a ceiling. We didn't realize that we were filled with so much fear and anxiety or anger. But many of these things God is revealing to us because he's trying to take us to another level. And if we handle our wilderness well, then we will be able to manage the new season that we're about to enter into well. This is why the Lord led me to Ezra chapter 7 and Ezra chapter 8. Why? Because the book of Ezra emphasizes a period of time that is different than what we're experiencing right now, but the principles remain the same. So what you need to know is this, is that the children of God, including Ezra, they were in the wilderness for seven, they, they were in captivity, Babylonian captivity, for 70 years. For 70 years, they had been in physical and spiritual isolation. Literally, they were, some people were born in Babylonian captivity. They'd never seen Jerusalem. They'd never seen what, what, who God was. And they, they haven't had an encounter with God. They have been in Babylonian captivity all their lives. Some people left Jerusalem and were taken captive and they spent their time, their, their lives in Babylonian captivity and they died in Babylonian captivity. But right now, even in this text, you'll see as we end the message that it's the children of the people who were taken captive in Jerusalem, who are now in Babylon captivity, who were actually released and goes back to Jerusalem. But I need you to follow me because if you don't get this principle, you will be playing catch up uh, as I give you uh, some critical points. It's an important time in the life of the Israelites. What could it potentially be like to be in captivity in another country that you have to learn another language, another culture, another way of living, another way of doing business, and you do not have freedom. You can't go home when you want to go home. There is nothing that you can call home because you are in someone else's territory.
So much so that many people during their time in Babylonian captivity strayed away from the faith. Many people who trusted God heading into captivity were there for so long that God didn't move when they thought God was going to move. And because God didn't move or answer my prayers or get us out of captivity, some people stopped believing in God. They stopped trusting in God. And so there were faithful few people who continued to handle their wilderness well. No one knows how long wilderness experiences last. But one thing is certain is that while you're in your wilderness experience, matter of fact, your entire life should be, should consist of a trust in God, no matter the circumstances. And so they were in isolation. They were in captivity for 70 long years. And it had now come a point in time where they were being released from captivity and they were given permission by the enemy, the people who were responsible for taking them captive, they were given permission to now return back to Jerusalem to restore. I would ask you to repeat after me, but just that word restore. Somebody write restoration on in your notes. They were given permission to go back to Jerusalem to restore what was lost. As a matter of fact, when we read the text, you're going to discover something so powerful is that not only were they given permission by the king to go back to their homeland and to restore what they lost, it was the king and the treasury that gave them everything they needed to rebuild the temple and to rebuild their lives. So the same people who abused them, the same people who were responsible for them losing the things that they lost, the enemy was now the one that had to bless them. And so if you don't abandon your wilderness too soon, you won't be able to see what God is about to do. He's going to do some impossible things that we can't do with our own selves. I'm not just talking about Africa. I'm talking about America. I'm talking about the world. Whoever believes in God, there is a word for you today, not just for single, not just for married. This is for everybody struggling. And so what is fascinating about this text, how to exit the wilderness, is that they're now about to leave what was considered a very long wilderness experience. I'm talking, they don't have homes to, to call their own. They don't have, they, they are in someone else's territory, living on somebody else's time and lives. And now they're given permission to go back home. And so here's the thing. They're now about, about to go to Jerusalem to pick up the pieces of their lives. They're now exiting the wilderness and trying to find some normalcy because there are no jobs. They, they, they have to go and they have to build their lives up from the ground up. So imagine what it's like to have to go back. Now, now you're given permission to go back to normalcy. Now you're given permission to now try to pick up your lives and now try to, to, to live for the Lord and to trust God now that he's allowed you to leave this season. And so that's why I want to give you a couple of tips on how on what you need to do or what Ezra did. Ezra is the person that we need to focus on. And I won't be with you very long, but I just need to read a couple of passages. And what I want you to do is this. For homework, I need you to re-examine Exodus chapter 7 and ex or Ezra chapter 7 and Ezra chapter 8. Look at both of these because, yes, I'm going to give you some points, but what I believe God is about to do is that God is going, while you're reading and while you're making yourself available, God is going to reveal some things to you in chapter 7 and 8 of Ezra that's going to help you in this season. So for homework, go and say, Lord, open my eyes and reveal to me something that I need to know that applies to my life and watch God do it. I believe that God's going to do it and you need to believe it too. So, so join me. We understand the context. It seems like it doesn't make, it seems like it's not a real big thing, but for the king to give them permission to go back to Jerusalem and to also give them whatever they need so that they can restore their lives because they've been living a certain way while they were in the wilderness that it influenced the king. Get this, the way the believers were living while they were in the wilderness had an influence 
on the enemy, had an influence on the opposition. It changed, God was able to change the heart of the people who actually were responsible for them to, to act or being in captivity. And so God was able to change their heart, but the way they live influenced the people who were in direct opposition to them. So do me a favor in chapter seven, I'm gonna read a couple of verses. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make three quick movements. I want you to pay attention to how Ezra uh, exits the wilderness. I want you to pay attention to, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to give you that point yet. I want to give you that point yet. But I want, I want you to pay attention to what he does before he exits the wilderness and what he does as he exits the wilderness. So it's something that we need to be doing while we're in the wilderness. And there's something we need to do as we're beginning to try to go back to normalcy. And so I will read verse, chapter 7, verse 1 verse 6 through 15, and then I'll move around a little bit, but I want you to follow me. And so it says in verse 1, many years later during the king, or through the, during the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, there was a man named Ezra. He was the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hekiah. In verse 6, it says, this Ezra was a scribe who was well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given to the people of Israel. And so when you, when you see that, when it says that Ezra was a scribe who was well-versed in the law of Moses, what it's saying is that, that Ezra was well-versed in the word of God, because during this time, the only word that he had was the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's, that's pretty much all he had. At this time, this was their Bible. And the Bible is saying that he was well-versed in the word of God. So don't miss that. And it says, he came up to Jerusalem from Babylon, and the king gave him everything he asked for. Everybody follow this. He came up from Jerusalem because he was, he was given permission to go to Jerusalem to see how everything was, to see if it's safe for everybody to go back. And then the Bible says that the king gave him everything he asked for. You know the hand of God is upon you when the Lord is able to allow the favor, his favor to cause anything you ask for, you are given. So the Bible says everything he asked for, he was given. And this is what it says, because the gracious hand of the Lord of God was on him. I want to know how can I have the hand of God upon me, the favor of God upon me. And it's going to teach us how we do that. It's going to give us some tips on how do we allow ourselves to be in a position so that God's favor can be upon us. One, we learn because he was well-versed in the word of God. We do know that as a scribe. And it says in verse 7, some of the people of Israel, as well as some of the priests, the Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and temple servants, traveled up to Jerusalem with him in the seven year of King Artaxerxes' reign. Verse 8, Ezra arrived in Jerusalem on August, verse 9, he had arranged to leave Babylon on April the 8th, uh, the very first day of the new year, and he arrived in Jerusalem on August the 4th, for the gracious hand was upon him. The gracious hand of God was upon him. This was because, verse 10, Ezra, Ezra had determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of God. Don't miss the revelation in the text. It gives you a what and a why. The text gives us a what and a why. It says, verse 9, he arranged to leave Babylon and arrive in Jerusalem for, the, for God's favor was upon him. And then it says in verse 10, this was because Ezra had determined in his heart, in his mind to study, not just study, because we don't just need a lot of people who know the word of God, know scripture and quote scripture. It's also about what it says. It says to study, but to also obey. I wish I had just a little help in here, but it says to obey the law of the Lord and to also teach it. It's not just about me gaining more and greater understanding, but it's also about me discipling others. It's also about me sharing the gospel with others. So even in this wilderness, he is making sure that he's studying, he's making sure that he's obeying, but he's making sure that he's still sharing the word of God. No matter the circumstances, I want to still make sure I'm fruitful. I can't just be fruitful when the season that I'm in works to my advantage. What am I saying? You don't just want to be a Christian who is productive and happy 
when situations work out in your favor, but even when you're in the wilderness, you want to still be fruitful. So even though he's still in Babylon, he is still being effective. All right. And so verse 11, King Artaxerxes had given a copy of the following letter. So what, what the king does is he writes a letter. He makes an edict of all the land. So what the king writes, everybody has to obey. So he writes, he makes a law. The king makes a law that is to the advantage of the Israelites and to Ezra. So in essence, Ezra is shifting the law in Babylon. And so don't think too small because I'm going to show you some of the things that Ezra does so much so that it impacts law. It impacts the government. It impacts what goes on. You can't just think the you can't just think what you're doing only impacts the people who are close to you, but you have the ability to change and shift government, the law, and everything else. And so the Bible teaches us that he passes a law. I'm only going to read just a little bit because I want to get you to these points. It says, the priest and scribe who studied and taught the commands or and the decrees of the Lord from Artaxerxes, the king of kings, to Ezra, the priest and teacher of the law uh, of the God of heaven. Greetings. It says, I decree, I want to make sure I'm reading everything. It says, I decree that any of the people of Israel in my kingdom, including the priests and Levites, may volunteer to return to Jerusalem with you. And so he's now giving them permission to be released from captivity. And he says, I and my counsel of, of seven hereby instruct you to conduct an inquiry into the situation in Judah and Jerusalem based on your God's law, which is in your hand. We also commission you to take with you silver and gold, which we are freely presenting as an offering to the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem. And so, so don't miss it. I'm reading, but I'm preaching. Literally, the text is saying that the, the king is saying, I'm giving you silver and gold because the way you've been living, I've been impacted so much that whatever you need to do to rebuild your life, listen, whatever you need to rebuild your life, whatever you need to restore what has been lost, I'm going to give it to you. Do not put God in a box. Do not expect God to move one way because God is not, he's, he's not, he's not, supposed to be in a box god will move any he will use the same people who fired you to turn around and give you surplus of money he, the same people who made you leave your home will be the same people will turn around and give you money or give you something that you do not put your god in a box because god is going to do something miraculous if you can just trust him through this season I, don't miss it. Don't, this is some good stuff. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. So let me read this and then I'll give you these, these few points, but it's preaching already. Furthermore, you are to take any silver, verse 16, and gold that you may obtain from the province of Babylon, as well as the voluntary offerings of the people and the priests that are presented for the temple of their God in Jerusalem. These donations are to be used specifically to purchase you know, the rams, the bulls, everything you need to satisfy your God. And look at verse 18. Any, any silver and gold that is left over may be used in whatever way you and your colleagues feel is the will of your God. Here is the king. He said, whatever you need to do with this, whatever is God's will, you do it. That's how much so his lifestyle, their lifestyle shifted the people who were in power. And then it says in verse 20, I want to make sure this last verse, if you need anything else for your God's temple or for any similar needs, you may take it from the royal treasury. So let me help you what he just said. Let me help you what the king just said. The king just said, I'm going to write you a blank check. Whatever you need, in addition to what you thought you needed, you may take it from the treasury and you don't even have to ask. They're in the wilderness, but they're exiting their wilderness. And I'm wondering, how is it that God's hand is upon him? What can I do so that I can position myself so that the hand of God is on me, no matter the season that I am in? Oh, my God. All right. Ezra did two things. I want you to pay attention. Ezra did three things while he was in exile, while he was in his wilderness. He did three things while he was in the wilderness, the reason why God's hand was upon him. 
And Ezra did three things upon exiting. So let me give this to you. I appreciate that amen in, 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 the, um, in the comment section. In the comment section. Here, don't miss this. Don't miss this. So what I want to know is if the Bible says that the hand of God was upon Ezra, so much so that whatever he asked, God allowed it to come to pass, so much so that his opposition had become his greatest ally, so much so that the enemy now is blessing him. What do I need to do to make sure that I'm in alignment like Ezra? Great question. Number one, learn the word of God. You are powerless if you do not know the word of God. In verse six, it says that Ezra was a scribe and he was well versed, right? But what you didn't read is this. In verse 11, this is what verse 11 says in chapter seven. It says, this is a copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes gave Ezra the priest, the scribe. It says, an expert in the words of the commandment of the Lord and the statutes of Israel. So on two different occasions, the writer reminds us that Ezra spent time in the word of God, so much so that he was able to navigate difficult terrain. Because you want to be able to not just quote scripture to be able to quote scripture, but you want to be able to quote scripture accurately. You want to be able to declare scripture over your situation contextually and accurately. What do I mean contextually? You want to be able to know the word of God so much that whatever situation you're in, you're able to know where you can find that in the word of God and you're able to speak that over your situation. But the Bible says that he studied the word of God. He learned the word of God. It is important even in this season because this is what I learned in the U.S. This, may, this is not an issue in Kenya. This is just an issue in the U.S. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what I learned during this pandemic. This doesn't impact you all at all. During this time of COVID, during this time of the pandemic, everyone is at home. And so everyone is just not managing their time well. You know, we just, you know, we stream movies. We, you know, find everything to do. And the last thing we're doing is maximizing our time to really truly study the word of God and grow closer in our intimacy with God. And so what we have is we're doing everything but what we need to do. And yes, we're focused on all the other things, but we're not managing time well. He's in the wilderness and he's becoming an expert of the word of God. All right, the second thing he does, Ezra set his heart to the Lord. He set his heart to the Lord. He, he set his heart from the Lord. Amen. We have somebody from Austria tuning in. Bless you. He set his heart to the Lord. Look at verse 8 through 10. It says, for Ezra, in, in chapter 7, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. That's the New King James Version. He set his heart to the Lord, and he was committed not just to set his heart, but he was committed to be obedient to what he knew the word of God was asking of him. So he prepared his heart while he was in the, he didn't wait for God to let him out of the wilderness. I'm going to prepare for my exiting of the wilderness, even though I'm in the middle of it. What are you doing with your time right now? He set his heart to the Lord and he was committed to being obedient to what God was revealing to him. You don't just need God to reveal you things if you're not going to be obedient to what he's showing you. This goes for not just in Mary, this goes for a single. It doesn't matter what your relationship status is. The word of God is the word of God, learning the word of God and being obedient to the word of God. But while he was in this uncertain situation, he made sure he set his heart to the Lord. And the third thing he did, the Bible teaches us, is that he helped to teach other people about the Lord to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. So it wasn't just about him learning. It wasn't just about him experiencing increase because what we can do in this time of our lives is that we can focus so much on self. We can fo focus so much on self that we don't take advantage of the opportunity to minister and still to impact other people. If God blesses my neighbor, that just means he's in the neighborhood. And so what we have to learn to do in this season is to not acquiesce or not to surrender or not to fall 
uh, captive to what the strategy of the enemy is. And what that is, he wants you to focus on self. What the enemy wants you to do is keep a focus on self. What I don't have, what I need, how I'm afraid, all the things, it's just, it's just like taking a selfie. The enemy wants you to focus on yourself during this season because if you focus on yourself during this season, you won't be able to see what God is trying to do to, do to and for you. You need an outward focus. You need to be able to focus on impacting and still sharing the word of God. Throughout history, God's children found themselves in situations similar, if not different than this. And so you want to make sure that you shift the lens. You shift the lens. And when I say shift the lens, stop. Make sure you don't become so preoccupied on self that you don't share the word of God and encourage other people. This is what he does while he's in the wilderness. He prepares himself. He becomes an expert of the word of God. He sets his heart on God and he makes sure that he, he's impacting other people. And, the, and one of the strong words is that he obeyed. He was obedient. And because he was obedient, the Bible says God's hand was upon him. If you want favor, just be obedient. You don't have to chase favor. Favor will chase you. All right, so, so, so let me get this because time is, is of the essence. So this is, these are, those are the three things that Ezra did while he was in his wilderness, right? But I want you to watch this because as he was preparing to exit his wilderness, because when you are faithful with your, in your wilderness, God will elevate and increase you in ways you, don't, you can't even imagine, spiritually and Physically, financially, psychologically, mentally, and emotionally, God will increase you if you can just handle your wilderness well. So watch this. I appreciate that. Amen. As he's exiting the wilderness, what do I mean by exiting the wilderness? The king has given him permission. Go back to your land. Restore what has been lost. Build up the temple. Make sure you protect the temple. Get your lives back so that you can be at one with your God. They're exiting the wilderness, and these are three things that he does. This is where chapter 8 of Ezra comes into play. This is where chapter 8, I'm going to give you the three things that he does. This will bless you. The first thing he does, this is what Ezra does. As he's about to leave the wilderness, one, Ezra surrounded himself with like-minded people. Don't, don't, don't discount this. Ezra surrounded himself with like-minded people. And so if there is a way, a catchy way that I can have you to remember that, Ezra prepared or he, he managed his access points. When I say access point, we all have access points. When I say access point, an access point is a portal through which somebody, somebody can engage or encounter you or influence you, a portal. It's by way, it's the way that somebody can actually influence or impact you, a portal, portal, access points, how people and things can access you. And when you do not guard your access points well, it can keep you in a season longer than you should be in. So we all have access points. What do I mean by that? When God blesses you, he usually filters resources through relationships. When God, for example, Ezra was blessed because the king blessed him. People, relationships, access points, right? And so how you are accessed, God will also filter his blessings, his resources to you through people, right? That's how God usually blesses us. He gets blessings and resources to us through relationships and people. But that's a double-edged sword. Yes, God will do that through our access points but you also have to guard your access points. So what I'm showing you is that as he's, as he's leaving the wilderness, he's making sure he's surrounding himself with like-minded people. He's guarding his access points because if you do not guard your access points, you can sabotage the very thing that God is trying to do for you because you got the wrong people who are accessing you, accessing you through content and contact people contacting you and, and things influencing you, content. You have to be mindful of these things. I know I'm saying a whole lot really fast. 
Content, what are you listening to? What music are you listening to? What gossip are you listening to? What complaining are you listening to? Access point, that's content. What are you watching? Content that will impact and influence you. Contact, how people contact you, people, relationships. You have to guard your access points well. So what you see in chapter eight, verse one, it says, here is a list of the family leaders and the genealogies of those who came with me. Everybody type in with me or write with me. This is important. And he says, from Babylon during the reign of King Artaxerxes. So he, he gives a list of all of the men. If you look at it from the New King James Version, it says, these are the heads of their families' houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes, who went up with me, who went up with me from Babylon. These are the people who went up with me. You do not need to sabotage your increase because you have the wrong people trying to go up with you. And so he has the right people, the like-minded people who are walking with him as he's trying to exit his wilderness. Do not sabotage your experience because you're still aligning yourself with the wrong people. The people went up with him. There are people who experienced elevation with him because these are people who are also obeying the word of God and also studying the word of God. All right. So the first thing he does is he surrounds himself with like-minded people. And the second thing, which is very big, Ezra focuses on worship. Now, this is the important thing. You will miss this because it doesn't say worship, W-O-R-S-H-I-P. But let me show you how he focuses on worship. Let me show you. Ezra focuses on worship as he's exiting the wilderness. If you look at verse 15, watch what happens in verse 15. He's leaving, heading to Jerusalem. And let me show you how he focuses on worship. The Bible says, I assembled the exiles at the Ahava Canal, and we camped there for three days while I went over the list of the people and the priests who had arrived. And this is what he says. I found that not one Levite had volunteered to come along. Now watch this. He's going over the list as they're preparing to leave and head to Jerusalem to restore their lives. But when he looks at the list of all the people, he discovered that there was not one Levite in the company. A Levite is the person in the temple who sings and worships, who is responsible. The, the, the Levite is literally the only person who can utter the word of God through music in the temple. The Levite are the people who actually lead worship. It is said that Le the word Levite means to cleave, right? It means to cleave. It is said that when a Levite would sing, that anybody who heard it, their soul would cleave to the Lord. He's looking at his list, and he's not so much in a hurry to get to the next season that he forgets to worship. That he, not, he, he puts a premium on worship. So he says, hold up. I'm looking at all y'all. The Lord has given us a green light to exit the wilderness, but there's nobody to lead worship. And I will not enter into this next season if worship is not a critical piece of what we do. So what I'm saying to you is, no matter what's going on, but see, the, the beauty here is we don't need Levites today. We are our own Levites. We can worship God our own selves. That's that Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, encourage yourselves, speak to yourselves in, in hymns. Um, it says in psalms and hymns and in spiritual songs, creating a melody in your heart unto the Lord. We can be our own worship leaders. But what you don't want to do is, don't just read the word of God. Don't just study the word of God. Make sure you put a premium on your worship, not focusing on a companion, not focusing on the job, not focusing on the corona, focusing on worship. Shift your focus. What he made sure he did was he did not leave out worship. And it is so easy for us to live a life without putting a premium on worship because people can't see whether or not we've been worshiping. But God knows if we've been ministering to him, because to worship God literally means to minister to the Lord. And so what I'm saying to you is, do not forget the power of worship. I got but a couple of minutes left, and let me give you 
uh, the most important, well, not the most important, but an equally important thing that I want to give you. The third and last thing that he does, when you look at the text in verse 21, after, he, after they were able to go out and to find 200 Levites, and now they were strong, now they were able to worship, look at what he does. The Bible says, then I proclaimed a fast. He declared a fast. Let me read it. Let me read it for you. You don't, you don't believe me. Verse 21. Verse 21, this is what it says. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our children and all of our possessions. I don't know. If maybe, maybe I'm reading a different Bible than you're reading. After everything he had done, he said, hold up. We're right here. We're, we're leaving the wilderness. We're on the road to head back to Jerusalem. But before I take another step, I'm going to make sure that we, fa I'm going to declare a fast among all of us. Everybody that I have influence of, everybody who is leaving the wilderness with me, we're going to fast together. What you see in this scenario that is so powerful is the power of reconciliation. Because you have family who are fasting, you have friends, you have people who are entrepreneurs, people who are probably going to be the business owners, you get people who may be the politicians, everybody who is with Ezra, they have to fast. And because they're fasting, there is power in reconciling family hurt. Because you can't fast if you're not reconciling with family and with friends and with people who offended you. And so now because you are fasting together, we have to reconcile. So there is spiritual healing happening right now as they're exiting the wilderness because he decides that he's going to proclaim a fast. And when he proclaims a fast, nothing is better than to have a spouse or to have a significant other that you fast with. Nothing is better than to have friends who are around you that you can fast with. You're talking about family members, sons and daughters and mothers and fathers and grandparents and grandchildren. Everybody's fasting together. He declared a fast. And when was the last time that we declared a fast? This is what I leave you with. Ezra de declares a fast because he wanted God to give him direction and to protect him. And the Bible says, don't miss this. The Bible says in verse 20 and 23, chapter 8 says, So we fasted and earnestly prayed that our God would take care of us, and he heard our prayer. And he answered our prayer. We fasted that God would, 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 would protect us and give us direction, and he immediately heard us. And he responded to us. Chapter 8, verse 23. As soon as we fasted, God responded. So let me, re let me remind you, I'm working on a book right now called Level Up, and it'll be out probably in the next 30 days, and it's dealing with fasting, literally how to fast more effectively. This is a thing that we forget, and some of us think we know how to fast, and there's some things that God wants to reveal to you, but when he fasts, this is some things that happen when you fast, and you fast appropriately. When you fast, you quicken the Spirit of God. When you fast, when he declared the fast, he asked God to do something and God showed up immediately. It just happened. When you fast, you quicken the spirit of God. When you fast, you, when I say quicken, you provoke God to answer. When you are fasting, and what I'm giving you, there's an, it's in no particular order of importance. I'm just giving you the things that happen when you fast. Number one, you quicken the spirit of God, meaning you provoke God to answer. When you declare a fast, you're choosing to crucify your flesh and to focus on your spirit. Oh, you're absolutely provoking God to come to your situation and to answer. Look at Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel, Daniel chapter 10. When God, when he fasted, God showed up. There were supernatural encounters when he fasted. The second thing, when you fast, it removes impossibilities. Make sure you write this down because you need to remind yourself of this. When you fast, it removes impossibilities. I got to give you these things as I leave you. When you fast, it removes impossibilities. What do you say? What do you mean by impossibilities, Isaac? The king said yes. The king wrote a blank check. 
Daniel couldn't have done that on Daniel's own strength by Daniel's or, or Ezra's own strength by himself. Like because he had this lifestyle of fasting, because he was obeying God, God's favor was upon him. And so when you fast, you remove the impossibilities. God is able to do the impossible in your life when you choose to say, I'm going to stop and I'm going to fast until you, I'm not going to, it didn't say that he said, we, we're going to fast for three days. No, he fasted until it was time for him not to fast. Ultimately, they fasted for three days in this context right here in, in chapter, in verse 23. And so the third thing that happens when you fast, when you fast, you neutralize the flesh so that you become a stronger conductor of spiritual power. When you fast, what you do is you neutralize your flesh to become a stronger conductor of spiritual power. Many of us are unable to hear God. Many of us are unable to move mountains. Many of us are unable, when I say mountains, I mean proverbial in this situation. What I mean is many of us aren't, aren't able to shift or break things in our lives because our flesh is so strong in our lives. And so when you fast, you begin to crucify your flesh. Look at the end of chapter five of Ephesians. When you begin to crucify your flesh, your flesh becomes weak and your spirit becomes stronger. And then now you're able to move things spiritually. You're able to hear God better when you fast. The, the fourth thing, Fasting helps restore the backslider or the person who has been at a distance with God. Fasting will restore your relationship with God. Fasting will restore the backslider and the person who has found themselves at a distance with God, right? That's what happens. And so in Ezra chapter 8, verse 35, Look at what it says. It says the children of those who had been carried away captive, meaning now the people who are the children and the grandchildren of the people who had been carried away to Babylon, these are the people going back to Jerusalem. It says who had come from captivity, they're now offering burnt offerings to God of Israel. What that text is saying is that the grandchildren of the people who were carried away to Babylon captivity who have now died now their children have returned to the Lord. Now they're offering sacrifices and they're worshiping God <laughs> because I'm fasting. When you fast, this is what you do. You're able, you're able, God is able to restore your relationship. Even now, many of us have found ourselves at a distance with God. This is what fasting will do. And the last thing, fasting will break yokes, burdens, and any bondage. Fasting will break yokes, burdens, and any bondage, any bondage. If you don't believe me, just look at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, uh, verse 6 says, this is God talking, is this not the fast that I want for you? Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6, this is the fast that I chose for you. It says to loose bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and to break every single yoke. That's the type of fast that I want for you. When you fast, generational cycles can be broken. When you fast, addictions, you know, can be exposed. And you're able to overcome. You can overcome spiritually. You can overcome with help. But, but fasting will be the key. So what Ezra was doing when he chose to fast, when you look at the text and you do this for homework, what he was doing, he was seeking intimacy with God. Because when you fast, more than God answering a prayer, more than God opening a door, more than God um, giving you what you feel you need. Fasting is seeking intimacy with God. The more you fast, the greater your intimacy. The more you fast, the greater your intimacy. The more you fast, the greater your intimacy.
And when he was fasting, what he was doing, when he was seeking direction, Lord, I don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. We don't know which path to take. We've been given clearance to leave Babylon, but we don't know what to do now. Can you give us direction? So I'm declaring a fast. And then the Bible says that God protected them from all their enemies as they were going. I mean, to, for to literally say that means that they actually had uh, some enemies to uh, attack them. I can't find the actual text. Yeah, verse 31, it says, then we departed the river of Ahaba after they finished fasting on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And, and the hand of the Lord was upon us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy uh, from ambush along the way. So yes, um, they were fasting and yes, they were given clearance and yes, God gave them directions, but the enemy still attempted to throw them off track. But the Bible says that God protected them. So when they was fasting, what he was asking God was for spiritual direction. And, he, and the last thing he was asking God for protection. And so I, uh, or when he was asking for protection, they were in an unfamiliar, unfamiliar season. He was asking God to protect the family, the children. And so that is really a powerful thing. When he was fasting, when he declared a fast upon the land, he was asking God to protect them. And he was asking God to reconcile the things that need to be reconciled. And so today, I simply want to encourage you that uh, it wasn't a time necessarily to discuss and talk about singleness, but whatever you are experiencing in your season, loneliness, anger, disappointment, all those are symptoms, right? Any parent, any adult, any person who has been sick knows that when you're sick, discover the symptoms, but don't become so preoccupied trying to meet the symptoms. You need to find out what the actual source of the problem is. And so in our lives today, what is so powerful is that we're not focusing on loneliness. We're not focusing on uh, being disappointed. We're not focused on, uh, I need a career, a job. We're not focusing. All those are symptoms. If I can learn to trust in God, if I can study his word, if I can set my heart to God, if I can obey his word, if I can share the word of the Lord with others, if I can protect my access points, if I can make sure that I focus on worship, if I can make sure that I do these things in light of fasting, anything else that I think is a problem, it's a symptom, it will subside. Lord, I bless you and I thank you for your word. I thank you for your power. And I pray, God, that it falls upon good ground. I pray, God, that you move in the lives of my family across the waters. We have people from Austria, from Kenya, from the U.S., and from many other places. I say thank you for allowing us to tune in. And I pray, God, that this word is a word that we chew on and that we feed on and that is nourishment to our spirits and our souls. In the name of Jesus, I say thank you. Amen. I appreciate you all for your word. I appreciate you for your presence. Let me say this before I give this back to Felista. I would love to remain connected with you. I intend to be back and to talk about whatever it is Felista wants me to talk about. If there's a series of messages, I don't care. I want to be able to to partner with you. Do me a favor, um, my YouTube channel, I would love for you to go to my YouTube channel at Isaac Curry. Uh, you see the way my name is spelled at YouTube. Go to that and subscribe to that channel because there's a lot of things that's going, going to happen moving forward that I want to make sure that I'm still in partnership with you and Parklands and no matter where you are in the world. You can find me on IG, Instagram at I am Isaac Curry. You can also find me on Facebook at I am Isaac Curry, my public page, not my private page, my public page. I would love to connect with you there, but this is not the last time you're going to see me. Felista. <laughs> oh my, yes, I'm here. I'm five, I'm four, I was four minutes over. I'm yes, sorry. that's all right. That's okay. So, oh, this is so awesome. This is so awesome 
And I really thank you for taking the time to just speak to us yes. and for allowing God to use you. Yes. I believe that the call to fasting has resonated with each one of us. And I believe that the ARC ministry, we are going to plan and call for a fast. If we cannot fast this time, mm -hmm. I don't see us fasting any other time. Mm -hmm. Because we you have know, an open heaven. You, you, absolutely. You know that that's powerful. And, and Felista, and this is, listen, everybody, your family in a whole different way. This isn't marketing. This is just me informing you because what yeah. I've come to learn when I led my people through a fast mm -hmm. is that you can be in church for 20 years and still not really know how to fast well. So I'm going to ask Felista that whenever I release my book, that okay. we also have a similar session on a Sunday like this that okay. I can speak that I can speak from the book because it's never too late to fast because and if there's a way that I can gift you some things whatever I need to do this is not about selling you a okay. book mm -hmm. you know this is about helping you to fast well fast more effective so whatever I can do to be impactful the same week that I release it I want to make sure that we're on here and we're going to talk about similar things I want to share the word of God with you, but I want to make sure that I help you in the area of fasting. If I do nothing else, I want to help you to fast more effectively. Amen. Amen. That is awesome. So I really appreciate it. We are now entering the, the open session where we can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I will ask you, Isaac, to stay on. Mm -hmm. And if we have any participant that has a question directly for you, we will mm -hmm. allow uh, probably uh, five questions. Okay. So the question five, is, yeah, five, five question. Five, they need five to be questions. on point. The yes. questions need to be on point. So I will allow five questions. Mm -hmm. As you, as we, as the people come up with a question, I would like you to on our group chat. Uh, I know some majority, some, some did not register. So we put two numbers that you can drop your name. Uh, this is my number, Pastor Felista. I'm the pastor, family pastor at Parklands Baptist. And there is Phyllis. Phyllis' number is on the, is on the Zoom invite. So, so it will be easy for you to get it. So drop your name. It will help us know who showed up so that we can invite you again to our follow-up session. Uh, I also want to recognize churches that are here. So on the Zoom chat, just drop the name of your church if you are a guest so that we acknowledge you. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. So if you have a question, just, just feel free to unmute yourself and then we listen to you. I promise you I'm very friendly. Um, okay. So everybody, um, and there's no question that's too off base or too small. Um, if you have a question, great. Thank you, Pastor Kari, and that was an amazing session. Mine is just to request if you can give us quick pointers on how to fast effectively now that you want to embark on it. Thank you. Oh, amen. Um, let's see. Uh, how can I, what, what can I, I wanted to try to include some of those things in there to fast effectively. Um, I'll tell you, this, I t I'll give you one pointer that I think was very transformative for me. Um, let me change this. Um, there's one thing that I learned that impacted me when it comes to fasting, and that is don't count, don't plan the days, count them. Just make sure you write that down. When it comes to fasting, don't plan the days, count them. And what I mean by that, what we, this is where we mess up. Now, there's tons of things, which is why I want to share the book with you, even if you don't purchase. I want to share it with you through teaching so that you can have the notes. Um, here's the thing. When you look at Daniel, look at Daniel chapter 1, 
Look at Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9 and 10. This, but you, if you look nothing else, look at Daniel chapter 1. Daniel, what we don't realize is when I say a Daniel fast, how long is a Daniel fast, everybody? Somebody, somebody give me a number or type. Three it. days. Three days. All right. So, so most people, all right, most people said 21 days. Now watch this. Yeah. Watch this. All right. You can mute yourselves. Now here's the trick. Here's where we mess up. What ha this is what I want to do. When we release the book, I want to have this session, Felista. This is the session I want to have. I want to have this session when I release the book, an open session for question and answers. I want to do it specifically, specifically with Kenya. We say Daniel Fast is 21 days, but what happens is this. We're basing that off of a Daniel chapter 10 experience, right? But what we forget is that when you look at Daniel chapter 1, Daniel, his first fast was for, was for 10 days. He fasted for 10 days, and when he fasted for 10 days, look at the text, you'll find that he fasted for 10 days, and after 10 days, the, king, or the king's men, they saw that Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, they looked better in physical shape than everybody else. And as a result of the 10-day the fast pr proving itself to be more efficient, what happened is they put everybody else, all of the other people, on a fast for three years. So technically, he started a fast for 10 days, turned around and fasted for three whole years because it took three years of training before you can enter into the king's court. And so they fasted on vegetables and water for three years. We don't know that. We don't see that. When you get to Daniel chapter 8, he fasts for three days. When you get to Daniel chapter 10, what we base our fast on, it's 21 days. It says, after three weeks of mourning and fasting and having no delicate food or, or no delicacy and no wine on my lips, uh, he says, then there, this supernatural encounter happens. And so we say, we want to do a Daniel fast for 21 days and nothing happens. Why doesn't nothing happen? Because we want a chapter 20, a chapter 10 experience without a chapter one obedience. Because we didn't do the legwork. We see what he did in chapter 10 for 21 days, but he also fasted for three years. What am I saying is this? The only time we see a time limit is when he did it for 10 days and the, um, we discovered the three years and we discovered the 21 days, but he never set out to say, this is how long I'm going to fast. I'm going to, give, I'm going to give God this amount of time to answer my prayer. That's not what Jesus, we know Jesus was in the wilderness for 40, 40 days because at the end of 40 days, he came out. When he went into the wilderness, the Bible doesn't say he was going into the wilderness for 40 days. No, it said he was there for 40 days. When you look at Moses on top of the mountain with God when he was fasting, Moses didn't go, God didn't say, Moses, come up here for 40 days. He said, come up unto me. He happened to be there for 40 days. What am I saying? When you fast, don't make the mistake of putting God on a time limit. Don't fast, say, I'm going I'm to fast for three days and God's going to answer me. No, you fast and every day that passes, you count that day. It may take you 22 days for God to show up, not 21 days. It may take you four weeks. I ended up fasting for, for six months, right? And so I was fasting for six months, but I didn't intend to fast for six months. And that's how my whole 2019 shifted and why I'm entering into a 2020 with God doing some wonderful things that you will hear about in the coming, in the coming months. So if there's one thing I can tell you is don't make the mistake of fasting and putting a date. Yes, you can, you can, you know, kind of plan, but don't put, don't put God on, don't put God on a time limit because everyone else who fasted, they fasted open-endedly and then they look back to say, that's how long I had to fast before God moved or broke something. Mm -hmm. Some of you have generational curses. Some of you have some things that are really deep rooted that it's going to take more than 21 days for God to, you know, to really move and to break some things. So don't restrict God to a day. Pastor, is that why sometimes we fast seven days, we fast 21 days, and we come out of the fast and we feel as if we have not gotten it? But we, yes. we end the fast yes. because the days are over. 
Yes, this is wow. this is what nobody is talking about, which is why I'm saying this is why I needed to write this book because nobody wow. told me this. Nobody shared this with me. So I want to write to you what I wish somebody had told me. I wish somebody had told me, hey, it's good to look at the calendar and have an idea, but don't go trying to base your fast off of Isaac's fast because you hadn't been putting in the work that I've been putting. Or I can't base my fast off of your fast because I don't know what you've been doing. I don't know the, the work that you've been putting in. So what has taken me six months might, might take you two years. But you have, I approach God this way. This is what I said to God. I said, God, I'm going to fast until something breaks. That's one of my, that's one of my devotionals in my book, Until Something Breaks. And I told God, I, ain't got, I, ain't, I don't have any end date in sight. I'm going to keep fasting. I'm not, I, 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 I told God, I said, somebody's going to give, either you or me, because I'm not going to stop fasting. I'm, 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 and it wasn't to be disrespectful to God because we have a very authentic relationship. What I was simply saying is, I'm going to keep crucif crucifying my flesh and I, whatever. I don't care. I'm going to keep doing it as long as it takes. Because, yes, I want a spouse. Yes, I want God to open doors. But more importantly, I want God, if I could tell you something else, is stop fasting for God to give you things. Stop fasting until, for God to uh, give you a better job. Stop get, uh, for a better life experience. Yeah, you, that's not what that that's disrespecting the purpose of fasting. Don't fast for a better job. Fast for a better relationship with the Lord. Everything else flows from your relationship. So you you fast for intimacy. Not for God to give. See, I'm preaching a whole nother message. So no, I'm not going to preach another message. I'm going to come back to you when, when the time is right for this to be able to talk to you about these things. So everybody who's online, give Felista your information so she knows how to engage you. The next time we have one of these sessions, make sure you connect with me because I'm, not, I'm going to have other sessions in the U.S., but I want to specifically do this with my people in Kenya and everybody else who's tuned in. Because whenever I can do this and have 75 people join, oh, this is why I this is why I love this is why I love Kenya now because y'all just hungry and faithful and I appreciate what God is doing. So I'm not gonna preach two messages. What I'm saying is what I'm sharing with you, if that's good, that's what yeah. I, you have no idea. You have no idea. Wow. wow. Amen. That is so awesome. I don't know if we have another question which you can pick because I need to leave 10 minutes for us to just engage on how they can plug in with Parklands Baptist. Yeah, I, I need to go question? myself because I get ministry okay. happening because it's 8.48 right. here. So okay. but I, I'm sorry I took so much time. Please Thank you. Forgive me. No, it's all right. You're welcome. Thank you, Pastor Isa. God bless you so much. Amen. Everybody, unmute yourself. I want to say bye to you all. Bye bye. Everybody. Okay. <laughs> bye. Thank, Thank you so bye. much. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Yes, you need Bye. to have a meeting in Vienna. Yeah, in Vienna, Austria. Bye. 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 Felicia yes. is the one who is the connector. I trust Felicia because she connects me with the right people. Yes. So I'm not going to do it myself. <laughs> I'm not going to do it through her. Sure, it will Felista. happen. You make it, you make you. it happen, Felicia. It will happen, I, yeah. I love you all. Thank make sure you. you connect with me on my platform, on the Facebook and the YouTube. I'll see you all later. Thank you. Felicia, Thank you. Make sure you give me the recording. Yes. Okay, bye -bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 All right, so I, I want to invite us to ask questions to us as Parklands Baptist. We already uh, talked about our programs. We have uh, divorce care. Divorce care is for those who have gone through divorce, are going through separation, or are thinking about it. We want to give you an opportunity to just come and have a team yes. that you're connecting with. So if you have a question on that, uh, 
Yeah. So we can, I'll ask uh, Jocelyn, just mute us. So you unmute yourself when you need.